It's almost showtime for SpaceX's massive Starship rocket. Indeed, there is only one week left until Starship's scheduled takeoff date. The team over at SpaceX is completing the final preparations for both Booster 9 and Ship 25 and the launch pad. Last week, the booster's lower chine covers were removed on Booster 9, exposing the high-pressure gas handling equipment that supplies spin-start gases for the turbo pumps on the 13 and engines. Chines, formerly known as nominal segments, were installed onto Booster 9 as aero covers for its COPVs. Luckily, over the weekend, Booster 9 had the bottom of its chines reinstalled. This is an absolutely good sign, as they'll need those for the flight. Interestingly enough, there is a new mesh net under the OLM, and I'm pretty sure this may be the first time that we've seen this. Judging by the fine mesh of the netting material itself, the less than adequate suspension system utilized to hold it in place and the height at which it has been placed beneath the work area above, it would appear to be for catching small debris falling from ongoing work above to protect workers and the water deluge plate surface. Also, big thanks to Starship Gazer for these amazing photos. The next step we hope to see is the replenishment of the tank farm. The final processing at the launch pad will include replenishing the tank farm and arming the flight termination system on Ship 25. The FTS, which has undergone modifications since the maiden launch, is designed to ensure the vehicle is destroyed if it deviates from the planned trajectory. Ship 25 will be restacked atop Booster 9 a day or so ahead of the launch countdown preparations. On launch day, SpaceX's flight director will run a poll and give the go-ahead for propellant load, setting the two-hour countdown clock into motion. The process of loading supercooled liquid oxygen and methane into the booster will happen some 20 minutes later, followed by the loading by the loading of the same propellants into the Starship upper stage. Chilling of the 33 Raptor 2 engines will commence once the countdown clock is down to less than 17 minutes. The Raptor startup sequence will begin with eight seconds left to go, followed shortly thereafter by the much-anticipated liftoff. With hopefully all 33 engines engaged and the rocket moving along its intended trajectory, the vehicle will travel along an easterly path above the Gulf of Mexico. Starship will reach Max-Q, the moment of maximum aerodynamic stress at the 55-second mark of the mission. The booster's boosting duties will end towards the three-minute mark of the mission, quickly followed by stage separation and ignition of the methane-fueled upper stage engines in the vacuum of space. While the main objective of this flight is to test the modifications on Booster 9, successful outcomes during Ship 25's leg of the flight will be seen as a bonus. This will give SpaceX confidence for future test flights, including a potential orbital velocity flight in early 2024. As SpaceX continues to refine its Starship program, the ultimate goal is to transition from test flights to an operational rocket. With each launch, the company aims to improve its technology and reach new milestones milestones in space exploration. At liftoff, the rocket will exert about 16.5 million pounds of force, which is obviously impressive, but even more impressive is Starship's pending status as a fully reusable launch vehicle. The fact that SpaceX wants to reuse both the Super Heavy Booster and the Starship upper stage is mind-boggling. Musk predicted that the chance of Starship reaching orbit the second time is much higher than the last one. Maybe it's like 60%, adding that it depends on how well well, we do at stage separation. Starship will very likely become a bona fide rocket someday, but as SpaceX has proven before, these things don't happen overnight. However, SpaceX will definitely go to the end with Starship. And also, when it comes to cost, there's nothing to be afraid of, as Elon Musk has recently shared on X that Starlink has achieved break-even cash flow. While Musk didn't state any time period, this means that the service's revenue is equal to Starlink's expenses, basically meaning that the product might start seeing its numbers in the green rather than red. SpaceX began launching Starlink satellites in 2018 with two test satellites called Tintin A and B. These satellites were a proof of concept to the technology that would later technology that would later come on the mass-produced Starlink satellites. A year later, the company began launching the version 0.9 satellites, 60 at a time. Now the company is launching its 2.0 mini satellites, is considered the largest operator 
orbiter of satellites in orbit and has over 2 million customers worldwide. There's a big upfront cost to developing a network of satellites in orbit and since 2018, Starlink has been operating at a loss. In 2022, the program had a cash flow positive quarter and in the first quarter of this year, SpaceX as a whole turned a profit. All of this while spending billions developing a fully reusable rocket in South Texas. Both Musk and SpaceX's COO Gwen Shotwell have talked about spinning Starlink out as its own company and taking it public. An initial public offering, or IPO, is a method where a company can take its shares to a public stock exchange for anyone to purchase. However, would taking Starlink public be a good thing for the company? Musk regularly discusses the pain of owning and operating a public company. While the businessman isn't known for having a filter on what he shares about his public company, Tesla, public companies also have a change in their motives. When a company is private, it can have a tight grip on its mission, spend money where it might not make sense to non-mission invested shareholders, and generally not worry about having to be open about its finances. Public companies have a much bigger responsibility to increase shareholder values, sometimes slowing down their innovation in the process. Another concern could be a downturn in the IPO market. Out of the last 100 100 IPOs, only 27 recorded a positive return as of market closing Friday. Only five of those IPOs had returns above or near 100%. Musk has stated that Starlink IPO consideration would come when the program went into the green. His recent statement could mean that the milestone is near or already here. So we'll have our answer of if a second Musk stock is coming soon enough. For the last bit of news for today, NASA has delayed the award of contract to develop a lunar rover for future Artemis missions by four months, raising concerns in the industry about the future of the program. NASA had intended to make an award for the Lunar Terrain Vehicle, or LTV, services contract in November. In a final request for proposals issued May 26th, NASA said it expected to make one or more awards on November 27th. At the time it issued the request for proposals, those proposals were due July 13th, a date later shifted to July 26. However, in recent weeks, NASA changed the expected contract award to March 31st of 2024. That change, made on a procurement website, did not disclose the reason for the four-month delay. A NASA spokesperson said on the 30th of October that the agency delayed the award to allow additional time to evaluate proposals, but did not elaborate. Industry officials speaking on background because of the ongoing procurement speculated that the delay may be linked to uncertainty about NASA's budget in the 2024 fiscal year. A delay to the end of March, they said, could give NASA more time to determine how much money they will have available for the LTV effort in the coming year, including whether they will be able to fund more than one award. Several companies have stated their plans to compete for the LTV contract, including startups like Astrolab and Intuitive Machines, as well as established companies like Lados, or Lados, Lockheed Martin, and Teledyne Brown. That has led to unique partnerships like Lockheed working with automaker General Motors and Lados partnering with NASCAR, the auto racing company. NASA expects to start using the rovers with the Artemis V mission at the end of the decade. As with some other elements of Artemis, NASA plans to procure the LTV lunar rover as a service, with companies owning the rovers and being able to use them for other applications when not needed for Artemis missions. In other services, in other service contracts, NASA has selected at least two providers, but for LTV, NASA said only that it would select one or more providers. Well, folks, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and if you want to support us even further, you can go on ahead and hop on over to our Patreon through the link in the description below. When you sign up, you'll get access to exclusive content. Nevertheless, we appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and from all of us here, we hope to see you again next time. Until then, keep looking up.